Hey everyone, it's Colin. How's it going? Apple's Macintosh debuted in 1984 as a cute, compact, all-in-one computer, but one that also lacked expandability. In just a few years, though, the company abruptly changed direction, and what came next set a new tone for the platform. By 1987, the Mac needed to evolve. It had been positioned since its launch as a computer useful for business functions, but its lack of expandability limited its growth. To reach a wider market, it needed to offer increased performance, larger displays, and the option for color. And so that's exactly what was delivered with the Macintosh 2. The most obvious change is that it embraced the modular desktop form factor that the rest of the computer industry had been offering for some time. Buyers could connect the monitor of their choice, and for the first time on the Mac, with the right video card, it could support color output. But there were many changes under the hood as well. The machine offered two built-in 800K floppy drives and was one of the first Macs to include an internal SCSI hard drive as an option. This particular machine appears to have had its drive replaced at some point, given its sticker indicating 1990, but the capacity of 40 megabytes is period accurate to when the machine shipped. The Mac 2 saw a solid step up in performance thanks to its use of a 16 MHz Motorola 68020 CPU. The Mac line up to that point had relied on an 8 MHz 68000. Improving performance further was an included floating point coprocessor along with 8 RAM slots supporting, at least initially, up to 8 MB of RAM. What was most exciting to some, though, was the inclusion of expansion slots. Apple didn't skimp here either, offering six Nubus connectors on the motherboard. Nubus is often thought of as a proprietary Mac technology, given that no other mainstream computers used it, but it was actually developed by MIT. Later, Western Digital and Texas Instruments extended it for use in their own computer platforms, and it was ratified as the IEEE 1196 standard in 1987. Complying with a standard would make it easier for manufacturers to make cards for the Mac. The first new bus card every Mac 2 owner got was a video card, because the machine didn't otherwise have one built in. The most common option supported up to 256 colors at a resolution of 640 by 480, but in short order, third parties started offering their own higher-end cards. Early Mac 2s had an interesting bug when it came to those slots, though. High-end cards that had more than one megabyte of onboard memory couldn't be recognized correctly due to a problem with the computer's ROM. The upside is that at the time, only one such card existed, a RAM disk from National Semiconductor, and Apple was quick to fix the problem and offer replacement ROMs for affected customers. A small but impactful change was how keyboards and mice connected. The Mac 2 used the new Apple Desktop Bus protocol for input devices. ADB had actually made its debut in 1986 with the Apple 2GS, but all new Macs going forward would use it as well. It allowed for daisy-chaining keyboards, mice, and other devices like trackballs and graphics tablets, and ended up on every Mac until 1999. The machine also introduced the concept of soft power to the platform. Instead of needing to flip a physical switch to turn the computer on and off, one could simply press a power key on the keyboard. That new interface required new keyboards and mice, of course, and Apple introduced them with the Mac 2 as well. The ADB mouse was slimmer and sleeker than the serial-based mice previous Macs used, and now there were two ADB keyboards to choose from. Both included numeric keypads, but the larger Apple Extended Keyboard was full-sized and solidly built. It and its second revision used ALPS mechanical key switches, which provide a nice tactile, but not overly clicky, typing experience. 
These extended models are actually fairly sought after by keyboard enthusiasts today, who can, through the use of adapters, put them to use on modern systems. Of course, a Mac 2 setup wouldn't be complete without a monitor, and Apple debuted two models alongside it. One was a grayscale 12-inch display, but the other had a 13-inch color screen, and that's what the majority of owners went with. It featured a resolution of 640x480, which was a nice improvement from the all-in-one Mac's 512x342. Reviewers raved about its sharpness and color rendition, which was likely thanks to its use of a Sony Trinitron CRT. The Mac 2 wasn't the only new machine Apple introduced in 1987, though. The company was still interested in producing compact Macs and launched the Mac SE alongside it. SE stood for System Expansion, and like its larger sibling, it included a card slot, though just one due to its cramped internals. It also offered the option of an internal hard drive, though it stuck with the 68000 processor. Reportedly, both machines had been developed partly in secret, not for fear of the competition, but rather because of Steve Jobs. He hated the idea of expandability on the Mac and would have killed the projects if he had found out about them. It's likely that the machines only ever saw the light of day because Jobs was pushed out of Apple in 1985. The Mac 2's goal was to expand the platform's reach in business. While the machine had its work cut out for it in the face of IBM's PC and clone systems, the Mac 2 was somewhat successful. Not only would it provide a major boost for the graphic design and desktop publishing industry that had fallen in love with the Mac, but other companies also started to support it. Like Silicon Beach Software's Super 3D in July of 1987, and Autodesk's AutoCAD software in 1988. The machine was also appealing to universities for research purposes because Apple promised a version of the Unix operating system. But for various reasons, that never really fulfilled its potential. Still, the Mac 2 was a gargantuan leap for the platform, one that spawned two direct successors. In 1989, Apple released the 2X, which bumped the CPU up to a 16 MHz 68030 and upgraded the floppy drive to one that supported high-density disks. But that machine paled in comparison to the final one that used the Mac 2 case design, the 2FX from 1990. Apple went all out with it, using a 40 MHz 68030 processor and bumping the maximum RAM up to an insane, at the time, 128 megabytes. It was an incredibly fast machine, but of course, that power also came at a price. Nearly $10,000 US for one with 4 megabytes of RAM and an 80 megabyte hard drive. At its launch in early 1987, the original Mac 2 wasn't nearly that expensive, but still wasn't cheap either, a bit over $5,000. That put it squarely in the professional market. Very few would buy one for personal use, so the Mac SE ended up being a far bigger seller at $2,900. These days, while the Mac 2 is an interesting machine, retro collectors find it less desirable than some of its counterparts. While there are some bragging rights to be had by owning such a battle station of a computer, there are some practical trade-offs to be made. Those 800K floppy drives are a big limiting factor. You can't just swap them for more convenient 1.44 megabyte drives, as the machine's ROM can't support them. And with no external floppy drive connector, hooking up something like a floppy MU gets a bit messy. Other than the typical concerns about failing electrolytic caps, the Mac 2 also needs to have working batteries on its motherboard. Yes, plural. One battery is for the system clock or PRAM, and the other is for the soft power circuit. If they're dead, the machine won't boot, and on some motherboard revisions, they're soldered in place. And finally, there's simply the issue of size. These are big, heavy, and somewhat awkward to store. 
A slightly newer machine like a Mac 2CX or 2CI is about half the size, but performs even better and still has plenty of late 80s retro Mac appeal. Still, though, the Mac 2 was a groundbreaking machine for its time and showed that Apple was serious about the business market. And while over the long term the company found only mixed success in that regard, the machine pioneered a few technologies that found their way into new Macs for over a decade. And perhaps more importantly, it signaled that Apple was finally ready for the Mac to evolve beyond cute, compact machines and into a platform all its own. If you like the video, I'd appreciate a thumbs up and be sure to subscribe. You can follow me on social media at thisdoesnotcomp. And as always, thanks for watching.